And welcome back to the show, everyone. My name is Brian Elam. I will be your host here on this portion of the Be Successful series. And today, I have the pleasure of having Kian Frith here with us today. And Kian has had an amazing journey, and it's already ramping up and going to be continuing. The guy's got big dreams. I can't wait to get into it so you can hear what he has going on. But all the way from starting as an accountant up to a CFO to coaching and consulting, helping businesses up level, businesses of all sizes and all dynamic things that need to shift. So Key and I am really excited to speak with you. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, that, that that introduction, like that, that kind of elevates me way, way, way too much, but I really appreciate it. Thank you. You know, that's I'm not just the, a humble accountant. <laughs> I, <laughs> well, not from what I've been reading, but hey, oh, you know, okay. I've I've heard that on <laughs> on multiple other occasions. Like, oh, you talked me up too much. Now I'm nervous. No, <laughs> no, no. Any, you just we're just gonna have fun and we're just gonna chat. So uh, I just want to start at the beginning. Really, like you've had, like I said in the opening, you have had a an amazing career, a wild ride. So tell me, how does one start? with going from an accountant to all of those things that I said previously, and was it intentional? <laughs> well, do you know, you've actually touched on something there right at the end, which is why I've laughed. Um, at one point, many years ago, I thought about starting a blog called The Accidental Accountant, because I fell into accountancy. Uh, when I was at school, I wanted to be a Royal Marine. Back in England, I wanted to, desperately wanted to be in the military, wanted to be a Royal Marine. Went off, went off to do the potential recruits course and was physically extremely fit, very bright, could cope with it. I had a real ego issue and I couldn't take being spoken to by a very short squaddy. And um, that wasn't going to work for me. So I remember going back home and, and my parents going, well, do you want to go back and finish your A-levels? Um, no, you're doing straight A's. I'm like, no. I, I don't want to do that. And I was having a real crisis. Uh, and there's a lot more to the story, but there was a real crisis going on in my head and in my life at that time. And I started just doing some temporary work. And then this training contract came up at a local accountant's um, real basic. It was £3,200 a year. So, you know, sort of three and a half thousand dollars a year training contract. I was like, but I thought by starting that contract, like, I've made it. It's like, it was a big thing, but I literally fell into accountancy really by accident. I'd always liked numbers, um, but I went into it. And did I look back? I have looked back at times. Uh, there have been moments where a lot of people thought I was always going to be an outdoor instructor, a uh, team leader, helping, guiding people using outdoor sports. And I've ended up as an accountant, but it opened so many doors. And being the kind of character I am, I've kind of talked my way into certain things. And I've just had an amazing journey. I've met incredible people. I've been humbled. I've been taught. I've been mentored. And there have been some individuals that have just stood out in my life who have helped me beyond all measure and got me to a place now where I'm able to give back. And that's the most precious thing ever. It's living now here in San Antonio, Texas and being able to give back and help others. Absolutely. I don't know if that's the kind of answer you wanted, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> The accidental accountant. <laughs> right, right. I mean, that just goes to show you that you can plan all you want for the life that you think you're going to have. But, you know, like I say all the time, you know, humans make plans and God laughs. So. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, w without a doubt. And um, did I have big plans when I started out training? No, I went with the flow. I ended up moving from England out to the Channel Islands. I lived in Guernsey for many years. And nothing was terribly planned. I went by this flying by the seat of my pants. A lot of my past had just meant I, maybe I was running away. I was escaping certain things and I just went with the flow. And, um, you know, back in my early twenties, I thought I had faith after many years of no faith whatsoever. And it wasn't until my first marriage ended in 2018 that I came to a realization of the fact that I hadn't dealt with some certain things in my life. And that's where God met me and went, okay, now are you listening, Ian? And, and it, it took me on a whole new trajectory, but I had a lot of regrets from the past, the things that I'd done and decisions I've made. Um, but now I'm on a new journey, which is awesome. Did you find that it 
was something that you had to do to go back and kind of rectify those past things that you were regretful about or like apologize to people? There's an awful lot of people I've apologized to, a lot of people that have been hurt and probably still feeling hurt. And there's only so much that I can do there now. And the rest of it is left to to God and it's left to prayer, um, a lot of prayer. And um, I found it very hard to uh, forgive myself. Uh, 18 months of counseling, I, I was adopted when I was very, um, very young and it had some trauma had gone through my life that had never been diagnosed and never dealt with. And I didn't go through counseling until I was in my 40s and 18 months of really intense counseling enabled dramatic change. Uh, great, great guy back in Nottingham in England who just journeyed with me for 18 months. Um, real Christian who just drew alongside and um, yeah, broke down things that I'd never dealt with. So really appreciative of that. And there's only so much we can do as humans sometimes. We can say sorry as, many, as much as we like, but um, people like to see action and some people just can't forgive. So you have to just try and deal with that. That's a very good point. You can only do what you can do and the rest, the other person has to be willing to receive. Or Indeed. like you said, watch for those actions that you put out now that have signified that you've changed. Yeah. Yeah. There's only so much that you can do. And obviously talking with you, you are a very humble man. You have a, a spiritual basis and you mentioned earlier on your journey, you were grateful for the people that had stepped in to your life and functioned as, you know, those people to push you, challenge you, mentor you. Now, uh, is that how you kind of began this rise? Like somebody else saw something in you and asked you to step up? I, I was, hmm. there, there were a couple of jobs that I'd had where there were um, key individuals who are just very good managers. They're very good mentors. Uh, one of them in particular was back in Guernsey, uh, a lady by the name of Sharon McMillan. And we worked alongside each other. We were working at a firm called Mercator at that time, which subsequently has been bought out under uh, two rounds of private equity. Uh, but she, ju she just journeyed with me. She sat and listened to me. She, she coached me, but I didn't realize it at that time. And I was in my early 30s. I was full of arrogance, Brian. I really was. I thought I could do absolutely anything. And, and she brought me to a point where um, alongside the managing director, because there was a particular day, and I don't mind sharing this because it, it was a, a real coming into the light moment. I'd been on vacation. I'd been on holidays. We called it in England. And I'd come back and I sat down with the MD and I sat down with her and, and I was brought to my knees. My team had been complaining about me saying I wasn't, I wasn't leading the team properly. I wasn't interested in them. And basically the MD was implying, you need to resign and leave. And Sharon was like, you don't want to do that, do you? I was like, no, I don't. I want to step up. I want to rise to the challenge. I need to go and deal with this. I need to change as a person. And, and it was interesting. I, I was on a podcast yesterday and I was just sharing a little bit about this because it was actually the moment where I realized that collaboration was so immensely powerful. And so it shook me to the core. It really did. I was so upset with myself that I've been so stupid and I've been so full of ego and uh, my own self-importance. And then it stripped me back and you go, wait a minute, if I now work with people, I get people working alongside each other and pull this together and you just facilitate and enable great things happen. And, and so it revolutionized the way that I work from that moment, you know, I can, I can so, hear it. I can hear it in your story and your voice that it was <laughs> a very pivotal moment. And for someone who was dealing with ego, as a lot of young men do to have that just reality hit you right in the face. Yeah. In business and in life, you know, we're often faced with those forks in the road and you can choose, well, do you go left? Or do you go right? Do you shrink Indeed. away or do you step up? And that makes, to me, that's the difference between a successful business leader and someone who just kind of gets along. Not necessarily that they choose to step up in that moment, but mm -hmm. that they make a decision and they go, whichever direction that it is. Would you agree with that? Oh, with, without a doubt. 
without a doubt. I, mean, I don't know what kind of experience that you've had in business, but I've had several of those moments where you go, I can make a choice. Do I go th this way or do I go that way? I've been knocked down, you know, and you're down and you're feeling like you're, you're, you're out. And what are you going to do? Are you going to stay down? Are you going to let those people who who would love to see you stay down, who've been judging you and going, ha ha, you deserve that. Or are you going to rise up, you know, and you're going to continue to try and climb the mountain. And, and that's how I see life being. Um, in some of the imagery I use at times, um, I, I love hill climbing. I love um, being in the mountains. And there are moments you just feel like giving up, but you keep going. And, and it's one of the comments my wife has made is just having that resilience. So actually for, for people, if, if maybe they're listening to this and they're going, I, f I just feel beat. Like, how do I get back up? You have a choice. Do you want to stay down or do you want to rise to the challenge? And if you want to rise to the challenge, there are people there to help you. Perhaps they need to reach out to you, Brian. Perhaps they need to reach out to me and go, how do I get through this? You know, um, th there's ways out, you know. There is. And, you know, someone else that I've interviewed recently, uh, it's kind of funny you bring up climbing because she decided that she was going to go and summit Everest. <laughs> and uh -huh. uh, so she relates that obviously to the journey of being an entrepreneur and, and what they do is they, they go up a certain amount of, of feet and then they go back down about Indeed. 800 feet and then they camp there to let the body acclimate and they do it over and over and over again until they finally get to the top. And so, yeah, sometimes you do, you have to go backwards a little bit in order to go forward. But what she was saying is just like you were saying, are you going to stay down? She was saying, the key to a successful entrepreneur is grit. Without a doubt. Yeah. You have no, to have I, that I, grit. I, yeah, I, I to totally agree. And I, I think there's moments also with a risk appetite. So that person that you interviewed there, they had a risk appetite, which was willing to take them up into the into the death zone. Um, I, I love reading about Everest. I had a dream of climbing it uh, many years ago. My first wife said, well, you make a choice. You either climb Everest or we get married. Uh, mm -hmm. And... Yeah, I made a choice. Um, but are, are you willing to take yourself through the pain? Are you willing to to rise up? Because actually, ultimately, it, it's worth it for that level of achievement. I'm sure if she summited Everest, it, it was a moment that she will never forget. And she made it. And there's that, that sense of fulfillment. And, and I get that myself, even on just a, a little level where you've been knocked down and then something good happens and you celebrate it. It's something that's really positive has happened to a client or you, you've been introduced or that there's something to, yeah, literally just to celebrate. And you go, yeah, I, I'm glad I didn't just stay down. And I'm glad my risk appetite was such, I'm going to keep on pushing. And now I have a co-director of a business back in Guernsey, and I'm sure he won't mind me mentioning this, but Rudy, he, he's awesome absolutely awesome but rudy's risk appetite is very different to mine i am used to taking risks i've got a very entrepreneurial spirit these days which i never realized when i was working in the corporate world but when you're on your own and then suddenly you have to back yourself i've realized that my risk appetite is pretty flipping big and i'm very thankful that my wife victoria now also has um a similar kind of outlook and so we're willing to just keep getting beaten and rise up, beaten, rise up. And then all the time, time, you know, you take a few steps forward, a few steps back, a few steps forward, but you're always constantly going up the mountain. But Rudy, he, he would admit he, he's not willing to do that. And, and you know, we have a difference. He's an awesome guy, immensely talented. Um, but I just got a ri different risk appetite. And I find joy in it. it I, I, I thrive in that kind of environment, but it also means that the people that I work with, you know, entrepreneurs, invariably they've got big egos, they're fairly arrogant quite often, um, they've got big dreams, big plans, they're getting knocked back constantly, but at the same time, I can empathize with them. I know that journey, I know that mindset, and, and hopefully over a period of time, working with them to break that down so that they go, okay, wait a minute, is this a different way of having to lead, you know, so... Yeah. And you're, you're going exactly where I wanted to touch on, which was the, the human element of what it is that you do and the quote unquote soft skills. And how would you say, like, how important are those soft skills in order to have 
and recognize and implement inside of what you do as a, a high level <laughs> business consultant? See, see, this is this is I, I, the reason I'm laughing is I was having a conversation yesterday with um, somebody who's a coach, and like they were questioning me. Well, Kian, are you a coach or are you a consultant? I said I'm hybrid, <laughs> and I am. I but I think really because of my background as an accountant, we are doers, we're solvers, we're enablers, we're facilitators. Um, especially as a CFO, we touch every area of the business. So as my friend Bo reminded me, Kian, you are a consultant. You wear a utility belt around your waist. You listen, you analyze, and then you try to find a solution from within your utility belt and pull out what it is that's needed. And that that is crucial to how I operate. But my coach side of me um, listens and my coach side then understands the, the journey that that person is on and I can draw alongside them. And, and that's the coach me. That's the, 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 the Christ follower, the Jesus follower, uh, the, the, the business discipleship kind of leader in me that goes maybe a pastoral heart. Goes, I can listen and I'll journey with you at the same time. So the person I was talking to yesterday is the coach was, well, you're very scientific, Ian, and, and I'm more arty. And well, I didn't have the opportunity to say this. Yes, I'm very scientific. I can analyze and break things down. But when it's needed, I'll draw on the bit that I need to draw on for the benefit of the person that I'm spending the time with and helping and guiding. Yep, absolutely. And did you take any kind of training? I know there's all kinds of organizations and trainings out there when it comes to coaching. Did you go through any of that or was this just something that you know, through your years of experience that you just kind of picked up and were naturally gifted with? So I've not done any formal coaching qualifications. I don't have any certifications to say you are a qualified coach. I have 20 years as a as an accountant in a variety of sectors, both sides of this very large pond. I have been in business for over 25 years, working with businesses from very small to extremely large. And the, I think the coaching side of it probably comes more out of the fact that I took a career break. I went off to do Bible college. You call it Bible seminary. I was living in Scotland and I did a, um, a diploma in theology. And that knowledge, that pastoral kind of heart, um, I think is very important into the coaching. So do I have a formal coaching qualification? I have a diploma in theology, which gives me an understanding of people, I suppose. That I was going to exactly say that it's more of a uh, unofficial degree in psychology, and indeed, and understanding the human condition and and being able to empathize with it from having that pastoral heart, like what you were saying. So sure. so good, so important. <laughs> I love that, and and just going down that rabbit hole just a little bit further um with these skills being so important these days in business and and people entrepreneurs starting to understand that you have to recognize acknowledge and and lift up the people that are working with you uh how do you start implementing those types of skills with within those business leaders yes sir i think from from my perspective one of the crucial aspects is that um and I've, I've seen this in others, which is why it's been, so it's been modeled into me and I now want to model into them. I think there's, there's moments when some of this can't be taught. It has to be seen. It has to be modeled to them. And it's the language the, that you use and the way that you draw alongside. There are certain things I tell. There are certain things I spell out in a very scientific way. And there are other things that are much softer and it's the questioning and it's allowing things to resonate and allow to go through that person's mind so that they go on a slight journey of self-discovery. Um, that would be very much my kind of approach. You sow seeds. And, um, you know, from a scriptural basis, I, I'm very happy if it's for me that that seed is like a mustard seed. It's a very tiny seed and somebody else comes along and, and they water it and they do more. But my part is, yeah, modeling asking questions, being soft at, at times. There are moments where there's some tough love and there are moments where uh, you can tell things straight. You know, like, did you seriously just deal with that situation in that way? How else could you have dealt with it? What, what would be a better leader's response there? What would be a better way of taking this forward? 
So just as you were talking there, I was getting this this image in my mind about a, a way that you could possibly, not necessarily you, because I don't know your process, but someone who is coming into an organization as a coach or even as a, uh, as a business leader thinking about hiring a coach or a consultant, something you could do is take an employee that is maybe struggling, not hitting their KPIs, whatever it is, bring them into the room with the CEO and also with the coach, but have the coach ask the questions and connect while the CEO just sits there and watches and listens to, like you said, plant that seed. Do you think that sounds like a good idea? You know, that'd be fascinating. Have you ever tried doing that yourself? No, I have not. But as okay. you were talking, like I said, it just popped up in my mind. I was like, ooh, I wonder if that would work. I should ask Ian. <laughs> Do you know, I think there's two two aspects there. One, what I'd love, to, I'd love the idea. On one occasion, I'd like to see the CEO ask the questions. And on another occasion, then try my approach or a coach's approach and see which one delivered the results. Oh. I suspect that with certain CEOs, they were going like, okay, what, what's going on? This was your targets. Why didn't you hit it? You know, and I do this because there are moments when uh, I go in and like, are you hitting your targets? Come on, what's going on with the metrics? KPIs, no, let's look at this dashboard. And I can do that maybe more with a CEO, but I, I think there's so many CEOs that just, they're so driven and they're just like tunneled on the numbers. Why haven't you done this? And they get aggressive. Well, I'd go, wait a minute. What's going on at home? Because I wonder how many times the CEO has no idea what's going on in that person's life. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And perhaps it's, there, there's something that's impacting their ability to do work to the, to the best of their ability or to, to the level that the CEO is expecting. And nobody had a clue because the question wasn't asked. Yeah. And I think it's very, very important. I'm so glad that you asked that question right here because I think there's a lot of people that are in those spaces in business that could be helped by just, hey, why don't I know anything about my employees in their home life? Not that you have to, you know, go through their whole 23 and me family history, but just, hey, is something going on? Are you okay? That, Indeed. that could be huge, huge for morale. I, I mean, I wonder how, how often in a small business, you know, a CEO, MD is walking the shop floor, getting to know the people that are working for them can go, hey, I know Jim is going through that situation at the moment. Okay, so we can understand what's going on. That doesn't mean, you know, we want that to stay the situation, but actually how can how can we support Jim? You know, okay, Teresa is going through that. Okay, we understand what Teresa is going through. You know, and the CEO working with HR or people, an organization, whatever businesses call it these days, have that understanding and they understand maybe some impact that's going on. Um, and it happens in some businesses. Some businesses are really in tune with it. And and some, I think here in San Antonio, uh, I found it such a, an interesting business environment. Uh, it feels like I've gone back in time when I've moved here from the UK. Um, I've joked before on, uh, I'm a co-host with the Let's Talk Business podcast that Mark Ebinger hosts here in San Antonio. I've got through so many business cards in, in the last sort of eight months than I have done in the last 20 years because it's old school here and there's a far more old school approach to business, um, which I was not expecting whatsoever. I thought when I was moving to America in July last year, that uh, here, here in America, business is always a bit the cutting edge and everything is just pushing, pushing, pushing. And like your banking system is antiquated compared to the banking system in the, in the UK, your systems and processes that just the, the uh, cognitive approach to business is quite different. I'm like, okay, I had to adapt a bit here and, and change a little bit. And and I think there's maybe some of the people stuff that hasn't trickled down to some of the small businesses. Mm. Yeah, very true. A lot of, and I'm sure this is somewhat similar across the pond, as they say, where people are, they get stuck in, well, this is the way that it's always done, or this oh. is tradition. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. From that side, I know that's right. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm going to take a moment. So I carry on. <laughs> you, you hit a nerve there. <laughs> I could tell. Uh, so right, right there, folks, if you didn't, if you didn't catch that, 
uh, understanding, if it didn't, you know, get through that EQ and the ego and all of that, doing the things the way they've always been done is not how you level up in business. So if that's what you want to do, take that reaction from Kia into heart right there. <laughs> the man who works with these high level companies. Oh my goodness. So talking about how, um, how things are done and always done and all this kind of stuff. We've got a business. <laughs> and I'll, I'll stop saying it. I promise. <laughs> I don't want to give you a tick. <laughs> You're good. But uh, in, in thinking about how things need to be done in order to mm -hmm. level up a business, what are some of the, actually, what are the key areas that you look at when you go into an organization that's brought you in? Sure. So uh, for, from a consultant perspective, um, people here in San Antonio know me as the numbers guy. Do I want to be known as that ongoing? I, I don't know, but that's how people see me. I'm the numbers guy. So I go, okay, fine. Let, let's play with that. So let's do business by numbers. And people go, well, you're an accountant. You're a CFO. You, you've been leading teams. So the numbers you're going to look at is, are dollars. It's fine. Yeah, it is the dollars, but it goes beyond that. So three sets of numbers that I look at. Dollars, absolutes, and dates. They've all got numbers in them, okay? And there's a reason for it. The dollars, okay, what is your profit and loss? What does your income statement look like? What does your revenues look like? What's your gross margin? What are your expenses like? Are you managing the expenses? What's your profit like? Are you tracking it? What Are you tracking it against a plan or a forecast? Are you forward thinking? Or are you like your CPAs? I apologize. I might get my high uh, on my soapbox here. Or are you like your CPAs and only ever looking backwards, which I'm not used to here in the US. In the UK, we're far more forward thinking. But most businesses aren't forward thinking, but I want them to be. So on the dollar perspective, are you looking at actuals against forecast? Are you monitoring variations and dealing with things? Are you taking action based on what your numbers are saying? The other one is the absolute numbers. So actual numbers sales funnel for example okay so your target was to take on five new clients this month you took on three let's look at how you achieve that three clients came from five inquiries came from this amount of effort on the sales funnel okay so you got three there you want to get five let's expand it but the businesses aren't analyzing this information invariably most businesses are using an external marketing agency and the marketing agency is going hey don't worry everything's going to be fine sign up to a 12-month contract with us and we'll make it all happen and i go are you looking at the statistics are you looking at the numbers coming through is it making sense are you getting the roi are you getting that return on investment what you're investing into that marketing company is it delivering you what you want and invariably, I have business owners then start to look at me with a very glazed face. Like, I don't ask those questions. Okay. So we just gone down with two sets of numbers and invariably there's gaps in both of those areas. Then the third one, dates. Why are you interested in dates? Well, are you doing things on time? Are you delivering on your action plan? So the due date was... Uh, 30th of April, are you on target for hitting 30th of April? You were due to have that done by the 31st of March. It wasn't done. Why not? What's the problem? Is there a, an issue that needs to be overcome because it's going to affect the business? Have you got milestones set up that you know what you're working to as a business, not just the leadership, but across the business of things that you want to be achieving? Have you set those things? Are you monitoring against it? And as I start to ask these questions along those three lines, invariably the penny drops and the business owner goes, I'm not managing this properly. Can you help us? And I go, of course I can. I have the expertise to do so. I have the team around me that can provide you with the help, whatever you need, whether it's from bookkeeping through to tax planning, um, coaching, consulting. We have the team within KB Impact um, and, and the associates that of course will help you. And so that's our approach. That's, that's perfect. And it really can be just as simple as that three things and the right questions. And then, like you said, the penny drops and, Indeed. and the, that realization hits. So yeah, guys, if you're, you're running your own business, you're running your own company, you want to level up and you want to know where to look at, just rewind, rewind <laughs> in the last minute and a half and take notes, listen to Kean again, because he's laying it all out there and, and giving you some great 
questions to look at your own organization at. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> Absolutely. No, thank you. Thank you. Um, and so talking about organizations, I'm curious, what is, what is your vision for KV Impact? Like, where do you see and want this organization to go? That's a really good question. Um, so we're, we're very, we're, we're boutique in the fact that we're small and I, I wouldn't wish us to remain small. I want us to help as many businesses as possible here in San Antonio, across Texas and across the US. I'm on a quest to empower business leaders and to enable them to run their businesses effectively. We would love to build out our team and have more people who are going to help and bless business owners. And I think um, when we were talking before coming on to this is I want to give back. I want to help business owners get equipped with the right skills so that their businesses flourish and thrive. Ultimately, uh, a tagline I use of helping business owners realize dreams. And I really want to do that so that actually business owners aren't going and working and just doing it day to day, month to month, year to year, but there's a purpose. What do you want to get to in three years, five years? Do you have personal dreams? Yeah, I want to travel the world for, the, for, for two years in five years time. Great. So how, do, how are we going to get there? Let's set you on the right trajectory to get there. And KV Impact, I want us to have that massive impact into businesses. And that's going to be San Antonio, Texas, and across the US. I love it. I love it. But, but there's more to it. So from our perspective, uh, my, my wife and I, we want KV Impact to be a, a God-honoring business um, for us, as Christ followers, it's immensely important that we do things that are honorable. Uh, I love the cowboy way, which is, uh, you know, my word is my bond. And we want our business to grow out in the right way with integrity, honesty. And we want to really just bless ministry works. And there are some things that we would love to do with the, the, the profits and the money that's raised within KV Impact to bless others, not just here in the US, but in other countries in Eastern Europe, in South America, in places where there is tremendous need. And that's a heart that we have. Are we there yet? No, we started KV Impact a year or so ago. I only landed here in July last year and I have been blessed to be introduced to so many incredible people. I'm immensely thankful to people like Mark Ebinger who've brought me into the Let's Talk Business podcast to give me access to people. Uh, apparently I have an accent and so he's leveraging that accent. Uh, apparently people enjoy hearing the English accent here in San Antonio and, and our business is starting to grow and flourish and we've got massive, massive dreams for the future. Very cool. Very cool. And I love the tagline of, of you know, helping business owners accomplish their dreams or ho however you said it. I, I Realize their so dreams. Realize their dreams. That's right. Make it real. Definitely. I Definitely. love that. Well, look, I wonder how many people are in business and their sole driver is, just, is to potentially make profit, but they're not checking the numbers. They have no real aspirations. They don't know what they want to do even for 2024, let alone 2025, they may be thinking about the future that maybe one day they're going to have to put their children through college or, and they're going to have to do some kind of planning, but actually they're not doing anything about it. But most CEOs, most MDs, most of those business owners, they do have an underlying dream. And if they don't, when you start to ask a the question, they go, actually, I, yeah, no, I, I want to exit in five years or, there is something else I want to do, but they've never stopped and thought about it. So when we start to have that conversation to understand where they want to be, again, the penny drops and they go, can you help us to, to get there, to realize that not, oh, we would love to journey with you? Of course we would. So. And that brings me to, you know, the next question that I wanted to ask you, which is what's the biggest, most gratifying win that you've ever had for a company? That's a really, that's a great, great question. So for the, an actual company, so there was a company I worked with several years ago and this may sound a little bit topsy-turvy. Uh, I worked with them for six months. We did a full turnaround and we put them into a whole new trajectory, which was a proof to me that I could do this in a business. That ended with 
me leaving that business because the MD and his father wanted to retain control. For me, that was gratifying. I did what I needed to do in that business to put them onto the new level and their profits and their revenues and their profits have just um, ex accelerated. We put a huge amount of change into a very short period of time. And um, that business, I'm sure it would not vocalize at all any thanks to me for what I did in that six months, but we did do a huge amount in that period of time. And was it... Um... Was it a complete shift as far as like what the business does? Like, did you switch like products or services or what did that look like? Turning dials is how I look at it. Turning dials. So an accountant and CFO has this uncanny ability to touch every aspect of a business. And one of the things I love doing is a discovery, a business analysis piece across the business to find out where we're inefficient, where we're not spending money wisely, where we're not doing stock management correctly, where, yeah, and just asking all those questions across the whole of the business and pulling it together into a picture of, okay, this is a position statement. This is where we're at the moment. This is what we're, we're dealing with here. Okay, let's now set that to one side and go, okay, where do you want to be as a business? And, and one of my biggest frustrations in business is, People who, who actually do a business plan and it's a great, huge volume, hundreds of pages. And I go, how on earth are you ever going to deliver against that? You, you, you're, it's not condensed enough. So one of the things I love to do is we do a plan on a page. Okay, We make it very high level, very strategic, with very clear indicators and KPIs. And now what we do is we take all that analysis piece of where the business is and we now start to align it to the uh, one pager and go, okay, this is now our action plan. These are all the things we're now going to go and do in the business. It's not going to be me. You need to go do that. You go and talk to that vendor. We need to put that technology in place. You need to change this process. And we start to touch all areas of the business to find a drive efficiency, productivity, increase revenues, increase profits, reduce costs where we can. Well, now we know what's in it for the business owners, obviously, when they work with you. And my next question, it, it it's more personal. And I'm wondering, why are you doing all this? What does Kean get out of running this business and living this life? What what are your vision and your goals? Well, for, for me, as I say, KV Impact, I want it to be uh, revenue generating, profit generating, so I can go and fund other mi ministries. I'd love to be able to put millions of dollars into um, some of the initiatives that are that are on my heart right now. And it's also a give back. I want to empower those business owners. I want those business owners to lead well. I want business owners, I want businesses to thrive here in San Antonio. I want businesses across the nation to be thriving and prosperous. Even the small businesses where they're struggling right now have put them onto a completely new trajectory. That's a, that's a personal kind of vision. Where am I being driven here? Well, you can probably see on this um, uh, background to my screen here is the Kingsman Project. Uh, this is something that is deeply personal to me. Uh, I was a man who failed in life. I really stuffed up. And over a period of years and through uh, counselling and, and being rebuilt, I'm a very different man now who just loves Jesus and wants to share my faith and wants to live out a much better life. The Kingsman Project is to try and help other men avoid the mistakes I made. And if they've gone through life and made the similar mistakes, I want to give them hope there's another way that they can elevate their faith and lead better in their families, in their workplaces, in their businesses. And the, the Kingsman Project is embryonic. There at the moment, the kingsmanproject.com is a landing page. We're inviting men to sign up and we're going to be sharing out newsletters and some content soon. But the actual global community will launch in the next couple of months where we're going to be trying to do what I've just said there as literally restoring men and elevating faith. And that that's where my massive heart is right this second for the next couple of years, probably. So it's, the business is to generate the funds and, and bless businesses. Personally, I want to just take my faith and, and help others. And then ultimately, watch this space. But in a few years' time, I think you'll see Keen and Victoria 
working together, that's my wife, uh, working together uh, in a global capacity. Oh, definitely. Speaking, speaking and inspiring people across the world. Yeah. I'll definitely be watching and be staying in touch. And then when these things develop, you know, typically I don't, typically I don't say this in an interview while we're still rolling, but when those things start to happen, I want you to come back on. I, I oh, want you to, I would love on. that. Thank and you. That I appreciate can, that. A hundred percent. I want this message and what you're doing to get out to as many people as possible. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. I mean, it, some people would go, uh, you know, maybe people from the past go, oh, this is ridiculous. Oh, it's just typical. Like, no, nah, I've been on the journey. Let's go share the story. And, and you know, people want to hear a story, but me to come and speak. Come, come speak in your business. Come and speak in, in your church organization or your mission organization. There's a phenomenal story. Uh, transformation. Absolute massive transformation that yeah. will inspire, motivate, and encourage without a doubt. I I don't have any doubt. And, and talking about transformation and stories, I was wondering what is what's one thing that you wish that you knew about business before you got started? That being uh, an arrogant business leader does not deliver results. And to quit uh, leading with ego and lead with humility. Yep, that's a huge lesson right there. Absolutely. Yeah. I feel stupid that for many years, Brian, I, I I didn't. And I probably hurt a lot of people and re really regret that. And I think there's a lot of business leaders who hurt people and offend people. And they probably don't actually really mean to do it. I never meant to do it. But we do just by the fact that that's our, our approach that we think is right. But we've not been challenged on it and we've not done anything about it. Or we have been challenged on it and we've been unwilling to change and when you have a wake-up call and you transform it makes such a difference yeah a hundred percent you it's so often in these situations and you know dealing with high level people that they have like you said their own way of operating their own way of doing things and it, it might not even be intentional with the way that they're coming across it, it's more to the fact of they just don't they don't see it because, hey, I've this is just me. You know, I've been me my entire life, you know, so I don't know what their problem is, but, you know, this is just me. And it's so it's so important to have at least a degree of humility if you really want to level up your business and your organization to just stop and think, hey, I need to ask these questions that Kean was just talking about. Maybe I should get in touch with Kean and just have a consultation, see if we can hire him and bring him in to just have a look behind the curtain, mm -hmm. see, see what questions we're not asking. It's just that, that one degree shift of your trajectory, even mentally, it can Definitely. make all the difference in the world. Definitely. No, no, without, without doubt. I mean, I spoke before about dials and the reason is you just turn dials, marketing, finance, operations, technology by just a tiny bit. It makes a huge difference. And actually you can do exactly the same thing in the mindset of a CEO, of a leader, of a business owner. A tiny shift in the dial makes such a difference. And invariably, the other thing I was thinking about is just as you were speaking, Brian, is that there are lots of CEOs. MDs, business owners who are suffering in silence. They have their own inner turmoils which have not been vocalized, not been shared with anyone. And so they are battling. Their personal life is a struggle. And wow. Wow. That is, that is in, is one of those things like it's so obvious. It just hits you in the face when somebody says it like that. You know, there's this saying out there in the world right now with mental health being so in the forefront of the conversation that, you know, just be kind because you don't know what anyone's dealing with. And in, in the in the aspect of being an entrepreneur, you know, humans as as social creatures, we need people to talk to and relate to. And if you're in that kind of a position, chances are the people that are in your immediate circle, if you start talking about business and entrepreneurship stuff, they're just going to glaze over. They have no idea what you're talking about. They can't connect. So it can feel incredibly lonely. I am so glad you said that. Definitely lonely. They don't feel they've got anyone to talk to. Well, they may not feel that way, but it's not the truth. And just Definitely have not. To, you just have to go looking again. 
drop that ego and just go looking because there's plenty of organizations out there like KV Impact that can connect with you, understand you, and help you. Absolutely. Definitely. Without and a doubt. Talking about talking about, you know, getting help and 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 lowering those guards, I want to see if I can potentially get you to lower your guard a little bit. <laughs> Ooh, drum so, roll. <laughs> drum roll, please. How'd you know I'm a drummer? <laughs> Are you really? I am, yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. I have a son who's a drummer and man, he's good. So, oh, awesome. Yeah, it, it's fun. It's fun. I've been doing it since I was 13 years old and playing in different bands pretty much ever since. And I truly oh, enjoy it. Love it. Love it. But uh, back back before we get down on that rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I thought I might distract you. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, you're not getting away with it. <laughs> okay. So um, in thinking about you know, mentorship and, 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 you know, lowering your guard, accepting help. I want to ask you the question, if you could talk to any leader that you look up to and respect, what would you ask them to help you level up? I wasn't kind of expecting that. I, I was kind of expecting the question of, well, do you have someone that, that you um, have coaching you and, and leveling you up and because I was about to say yes I do and I didn't think I needed it for years I never thought just uh, we'll come back I never thought I needed a coach I thought I knew what I was doing and I have a coach now and she's incredible she's been in business for an extremely long time and just asked most amazing questions so this is a shout out to Regina Bergman um, over in um, but here in Texas uh, awesome and, and really helping me to grow what would i ask i'd be really interested in in their critical life lessons their transforming moments that help them in their journey um, i'd be very interested to sit down and have a conversation for example with elon musk I would love to have sat down and had a conversation with Steve Jobs. I remember reading Walter Isaacson's uh, book on Steve Jobs and just being blown away and going, I'd love to have just been out of a conversation. There are some of these people that their leadership style, I think the perception is it's not the best, but again, what's driving them? What was going on in their life that meant that they were behaving in that kind of way? And, and what, what can I learn from that? Uh, I don't know if that's the leveling up type thing, but I want to learn from these people that they're running immensely successful businesses. How did they get to that? Did they get to that without treading on the toes of other people, without offending other people? And if they did, I want to learn. If they did offend people, do they regret doing that? Um, would they now would they now take a different approach with hindsight in their business? Or do they go, actually, I have no regrets? And it was just what had to be done. I don't right. know if that helps to level me up, but I just want to learn. I suppose, look, I, I, I said I became the accidental accountant. I, I, I did back in England, I did GCSEs. I did half of my A-levels. I never finished my A-levels. I never went to university. Um, many people would say, well, you're not very well educated, Kian. You know, you didn't finish your schooling. But I did lifelong learning. Uh, I've trained as an accountant. I've trained as a company a director. I've trained in... Um, project management i've done theology i've done a whole bunch of things and there was a, a a willingness to learn all the time and i think if i stop learning there's a real danger that i will stump my growth i stump my ability to help and bless others um i don't think i'm really answering your question correctly but i've just sensed that I would, I would want to learn from these people to help me change my my path, maybe, or, or check it. Well, you can it ask just, supplementals. <laughs> Go for it. No, no, it just, it just goes to show a prime example here about how the answer that we think we're looking for or the answer that we're expecting oftentimes is not that. Um, what you said beautifully transitions and touches on the mustard seed conversation that we were having earlier, planting those seeds by asking the question, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to break down to a tactic or a product or, you know, whatever it is, it could, 
be something as simple as I finally reconnected with my father and learned this lesson that I thought was a punishment from years ago, but realized he was giving me a gift. It could have, it, those shifts, whether they come from business or personal, it's the, it's the willingness to be able to discover those shifts. And like you said, learn from them and, and then, and then ask the follow-up questions, whether you have that time to sit down with that person or not, maybe you could find the answers in a, in an autobiography or something like that. Definitely. But no, you 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 did a phenomenal job answering that question. I think it's it, valid. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, earlier on, you asked me about lend and my guard, uh, and I'm going to take you in a, a slight different um, perspective now, uh, and uh, maybe just touch a little bit on dropping my guard. Um, and if people want more on this, I, I'm more than happy to go and speak on it um, anywhere because it's really important. I said uh, I was adopted. And um, I went into social care uh, around about the age of four. Uh, I had parents who were divorced uh, when I was about two years old, I had a younger sister, a younger biological sister. And I then had no contact with my biological family from that moment until a couple of years ago when my wife, Victoria, on one Tuesday when we were living in England, turned to me and said, honey, um, I think you ought to try and find your biological family. My relationship with my adopted parents have broken down and kind of alone, but I've been used to it. Um, very much bunker mentality for many, many years. One of my problems of things that had to come through in counseling. It was a Tuesday and Victoria says, let's, let's try and find. Well, she found an address of a relative or potential relative, wrote to them on that day and the letter went out on the Wednesday, it was received on the Thursday, and that relative then got in contact and said, yes, I'm a, I am a relative of your biological mother. I was then speaking to that biological mother later that day. So from the Tuesday to the Thursday, my wife had found my biological family. I then got in contact with my biological father, who I didn't think was the person I wanted to meet with. I thought he had failed me completely and it was about my mother and my sister it transpires now going down um a period of time I, I love my dad so much and we, we share a, a lot of it, very similar interests which is just unbelievable so back where i come from in england the tiny little county of cornwall all members of my family on the male side had all played rugby for cornwall at various stages of their um, career whether it's school boy or through to full 15 I played for Cornwall playing rugby and my dad was just so proud that that, that had happened one of the reasons I'm, I'm saying this is that um, what transpired is I, I write right-handed I'm left-footed when I went to my adopted family um, having been moved around between various families during my social care people couldn't work out if I was left-handed, right-handed, left-footed, right-footed, apparently I didn't know colours. I didn't. I couldn't write at all. I didn't know what things were, and people thought I was stupid. They didn't think I knew anything. What came out from talking to my biological family, talking to my dad, and especially my nan. My nan has just turned ninety-three yesterday, so it's a shout out to my nan back in Cornwall, oh, who right the second birthday. would be guy. She would be like. Ian, can you just speak proper, please? I don't understand what you're saying. You got your posh accent. Um, but my my nan was the one who told me, Kian, you were left-handed and you were a bonny wee lad. You knew your colours, you could write, you you were a bright kid. I was like, oh wow, I'd now write right-handed because nobody could work out what I was. What transpired is, and this is part of the transformation, is I was left-handed, left-footed, I was a bright kid, I had, you know, I had real prospects trauma at childhood had sat with me for decades untreated and that actually it took until just a few years ago then find the biological family that some piece of the jigsaw starts to come together and go okay i get it now. and i wonder if there's actually people maybe who are even listening to this going oh wow okay um i, I or actually i empathize with that i've been on this similar journey and, and perhaps they want to get in touch and just have a conversation going, hey, I understand exactly what you've gone through. Or even someone who's going through some stuff gone, I went to social care, I was adopted, and I struggled for decades and 
I just want to talk to someone. I understand what it's like. It was brutal without really realizing it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Because our, our brains are so young. We don't know how to process that kind of information that's coming in. So it gets all stuffed down and, and disorganized. And then we have these false beliefs that follow us around for our lives that are actually a product of, of like you said, that past trauma. I, I went through the same type of thing. Well, not the exact same type of thing, but uh, a, a similar thing with a, a teacher who in school was abusive towards me. And okay. I had... I had no idea, you know, that I was being abused. All I thought was, all I thought was, you know, well, it's whatever I'm doing, you know, I'm just me. So apparently it's not okay to be myself. And so that's how, that's how I processed that and internalized that. And it came up years, years later as these things do. And I had to go through a round of therapy myself to mm -hmm. like Gary V says, get that poison out. Yeah. So it's definitely. so important. But did, did that experience impact the way that you went through your teens, your early adulthood, how you were in business? It did for me um, because I, I felt that actually nobody cared. It was a bunker mentality and it was self-preservation all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. I was a very, independent kid coming up and and still to this day i i've gotten better at it but still to this day i have trouble asking people for help just asking and and it's it's tough i know a lot of people struggle with that um, indeed but yeah indeed. the more the more you do it and the more you put it in practice the more you get to see the the graciousness of humanity Definitely. But it's interesting. I think you've touched on something there that actually so many business owners and leaders are going through. They have past experiences themselves that have made them the person they are today, which means that actually invariably they don't want to ask for help. They don't want to ask anyone within the organization or open up to anyone in the organization. And they don't want to go to anyone external because they're in self-preservation mode. Mm. And it's helping them get to that point of going, let's just break down. Like you you said to me, you no, know, that let's, let's look, lower the barrier let's lower the barrier with some of these leaders because actually perhaps they're very good leaders right now they could be even better leaders if they overcame some of these other issues and they could just set the world on fire wouldn't that be awesome <laughs> that would be absolutely amazing and it would be an incredible gift you know to themselves their family everyone they want to impact especially if I'm sure like so many organizations you work with, they have bigger dreams and they are, they have that philanthropic heart. Yeah. It's, it's something definitely. that is definitely needed. So Kian, this has been an incredible conversation. I am so grateful that you came on and please tell us where we can go to get in touch with you, network with you, get into your world and just absorb all of this greatness coming out of you. Oh, bless you all. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I really appreciate it. If people listen to this, would like to get in touch with me, um, Kian, so that's K-Y-A-N at kvimpact.com. Or you can visit our website at www.kvimpact.com. And I live here in San Antonio, Texas. I always love meeting people for coffee. And if you're not in San Antonio, Texas, and you still want to meet, let's grab a virtual coffee. I'm always up for that. I always want to help and bless other people. And if you're a guy listening to this, you're a Christian guy and you go, do you know what? I would like to be part of um, your global project. Go and check out the kingsmanproject.com and sign up. That'd be wonderful. Absolutely. All right, guys. Well, all those links are going to be below. So check it out. Click, get in touch with Key and send him that email for that initial consultation. If you think your business might benefit, well, might come on who are we kidding would absolutely benefit from having kian on board for a little while go there and click and get in touch so again kian that. thank you so much for coming on man this was an absolute pleasure thank you so much appreciate it thank you brian 100 percent, 100 percent. thank you so much all right guys you know what to do like the show share the show with your friends especially people that are in the entrepreneurship realm even if they're not you never know who your post is going to touch so share the show subscribe if you like it and peace 
We will see you in the next one.